Welcome to Karis Daily Live Bible Study. Join believers from around the globe to study the Bible with Andrew Womack and instructors from Karis Bible College. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our Karis Daily Live Bible Study. My name's Claire, and I'm on staff at Karis, and uh, it's an honor that I'm your host this morning, and I'm so thankful you guys can join us. So um, most of you, if you are familiar with our program, uh, you kind of know our um, when we're live, but for those of you who don't know uh, when you can catch us live, I'm going to go through a few announcements, give you a bit of information, and then I'm going to hand you over to our amazing teacher this morning, who is Ricky Burge. So um, you can catch us live five days a week. Monday and Friday is 10 a.m., Tuesdays and Thursdays is 6 p.m., and then Wednesdays, 7 a.m., bright and early, and that's all mountain time. So hopefully you can do some calculating and catch us multiple times a week. Because if you can watch us live, then you're able to interact with us. And while Ricky's teaching this morning, if he mentions something that triggers a question or you want to know a little bit more about what he said, go ahead and submit your questions into the chat section on whatever platform you're watching on. And we'll get them and we'll try and get to as many as we can. Sometimes we get more questions than we can fit in but the last 10 to 15 minutes of this segment we are going to get to as many questions as we possibly can so yeah submit them you guys ask great questions and uh, we look forward to that so um just a couple of other announcements quickly uh, we've got some real cool events coming up uh, our washington gcc gospel truth conference is happening may 19th through the 21st um, those are always uh, it, it's great for those of you who want to meet Andrew and can see him live, but you can't quite make it up to Colorado. So the next one is happening in Washington. Uh, then in July, we have our In God We Trust performance. We put on uh, such amazing um, productions. If you've never seen one of our productions, I highly encourage you to come on up. We're going to be showing it on the 4th and 5th of July, and they really are phenomenal. Um, and then the week after that is our Summer Family Bible Conference. So that's happening from the 5th through the 8th of July. So just come and spend the week with us and um, you'll love it. If you've never be, been up before, Colorado is beautiful in the summertime. So I highly encourage you to take a family vacation and come and visit us. So if you need prayer, we have an amazing prayer team standing by. They're available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So whatever you need pray for, and even if you have a testimony that you'd like to share with us, maybe someone's prayed for you in the past and you want to just share what God did uh, through that partnership of prayer, uh, you can call our prayer line on 719-635-1111. And then while you're on the phone with them, uh, we have over 200,000 hours of free resources and materials. So just talk to one of our prayer ministers and ask them to send you something on any particular topic we, we cover. We've got uh, uh, resources on pretty much every topic of life. So just talk to them and they would love to bless you with something. And then um, while you're on the phone with them, if you would like to partner um, or donate to this ministry, the prayer line number again is 719-635-1111. And uh, you can donate online as well. Uh, go to awmi.net forward slash give. And um, if you do partner with this ministry or donate, thank you very much. It's because of people like you that we're able to reach more and more people every single day. Uh, the gospel is changing lives and it's because of you. So thank you very, very much. So now I'm done with my announcements. I'm going to hand you over to Ricky Burge. Good morning, sir. Hey, Claire. How are you doing? Super good. Good. Yes. How are you? I'm wonderful. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm excited to hear what you've got for us today. Um, you're such a good teacher. For those of you who don't know who Ricky Burge is, um, wait, you've just been promoted. What's your new job title? Um, I shine your shoes in the morning. Praise the Lord. Yep. He's our I shoe shiner. I start tomorrow. You do? <laughs> oh, I'm going to bring them all. I have three <laughs> pairs. <laughs> One at a time. <laughs> one shoe at a time or one pair? <laughs> one pair is fine. No, Ricky, you're awesome. Thanks, um, no, for real. What is your new job title? Dean of Education. That's right. So, uh, Man, you just keep ch -ch 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 -ch. Uh, so, uh, no, but you're, you're awesome, and I, we appreciate you. So you, uh, I'm excited to hear what you've got today. Praise the Lord, everybody. Mm -hmm. um, I hope you've had a great week. Um, 
I think the great start to May. Um, and so I want to share with you about the topic of intimacy with God, mm. something that I've been kind of meditating on <clears throat> for a while, but it's just been on my heart recently. Um, we've been in a very busy season here as we approach graduation, which uh, will be taking place next week. Thursday is our third year graduation. Saturday is our second year graduation. And um, we're just about to cross that finish line. And God's just been reminding me of some things about just staying connected with him and maintaining that intimacy, even in the busy seasons of life. And so that's really what I would like to share with you guys. I'm going to start off reading in 1 John chapter 1, and I'm going to read verses 1 to verses 3. All right, 1 John chapter 1, verse 1 to verse 3. It says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled, concerning the word of life, the life was manifested or made known or revealed, and we have seen, and, have, and we bear witness, and we declare to you that eternal life, which was with the Father, and was made known, manifested, revealed to us, that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. All right, so this is a beautiful scripture. Now, what John is saying, he says, this is this which was from the beginning. And, he's talk, and then he says, the word of life, this life was made known, revealed, it was manifested to us. And then he says, it's the, it, the, uh, what he declares to us is eternal life that was with the Father. Now, we know John 17, 3 says that eternal life. And this is John, again, uh, recording this. He says eternal life, um, quoting from Jesus, is uh, knowing God and his son, Jesus Christ, whom he sent. And so eternal life is knowing God, it's experiencing God, it's being connected with God. And so he says this eternal life, this relationship with God, this intimacy with God was from the beginning. And he says that now when Jesus came, when Jesus came into the earth, that his 12 apostles, they were actually exposed to this life. So the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, they had, they, they are one, three in one, the Trinity, right? The Godhead. They have relationship, community, intimacy within themselves from the beginning, from eternity past. And the Bible says when Jesus came into the earth, it says that that eternal life, that relationship was made known to the apostles. They got to experience that. And there were many times where they saw Jesus' relationship with the Father, and it kind of exposed them to this life, this relationship, this intimacy that man has with God. And so now he's saying that not only did we kind of experience it through Jesus when he was in his earthly, uh, during his earthly ministry, but now Jesus said, it's better for me that I would go because now that I go, I can send the comforter to you. And now you're going to have access to the father in the same way that I have access to the father. So now he says that, you know, John's not declaring, he's not just telling us his experiences, but he's inviting us into those experiences. He's saying that these are, these are things that I've experienced with God. And I just want you to know that you can have those very same experiences as well. He says, I want you to have fellowship with us and our fellowship is with the father and with his son, Jesus Christ. And so, uh, there's a huge difference between personal and professional relationships. And a lot of times we may kind of interact with God professionally, but what he's saying here, John is saying is that God wants to interact with you personally. Now, God is an authority figure. He's the highest authority figure that we have, right? He's God. He's the Lord of Lords, King of Kings. There's no debating, uh, debating that. But let's just say the highest authority figure we have in this nation, which would be the president. If I was the son of the president, I could, I could come and I could... Um, or let's just say if I was a staff member of the president, I would have to go through the protocols to actually get to uh, uh, the president's office. I would have to, and then I might only get five minutes. I may get 10 minutes, depends on the schedule. But there's a professional way that I would have to approach the president so that I could interact with him. And so if the president's son came to him, he wouldn't have to go through all the protocols. There wouldn't be time restraints put on him. Mm -hmm. He wouldn't have to deal with the secretary and the security, secret service, all of that. No, he could just walk right. He could text his father, actually, and the fa or call him in the middle of a meeting or whatever. Why? Because he has a different level of access 
to that authority figure. The, prof the staff member has a professional level of access with that uh, authority figure, but the, the son has a personal level of access to that. And that's how God wants us to be. He wants us to know that the door is open. He wants us to know that we have personal access to him and we don't have to approach him, you know, as this high and mighty authority figure, but he wants us to have fellowship with him. He wants us to be intimate with him and he wants us to see him as our father and not just as, you know, our, our king or our Lord. He is our king and our Lord, but he's also our father, which means that we don't just have a professional thing, but we have a personal uh, uh, access into relating with God. Now that word fellowship actually means joint participation. It means intercourse, intimacy, and partnership, right? And that's why I'm getting intimacy with God. He says, we have intimacy with God. And so John is inviting the church into this intimacy and eternal life is this relationship with the Lord to where he gave his life for us so that he can share his life with us. Right? That's what eternal life is. It's not just living forever. That's not what he's saying. He's saying this is this relationship that was in the beginning, and this very relationship is what God is trying to draw us in. He didn't just save us so that we could go to church or do ceremonies or rituals, but he saved us so that we could come back into a place of connection, to a place of intimacy that is satisfying the deep needs of our hearts and of our being. And so, that's what I want to talk today about. I want to talk about intimacy with God. Acts chapter 17, verse 28, God is the environment of our success. If you look at Acts 17, 28, it says, for in him, talking about in God, we live, we move and have our being as also some of your own poets have said, for we are his offspring. All right. We are his offspring. Now in the, in the book of Genesis, when God is um, creating the heavens and the earth. The Bible says that when he created the beast of the field, he spoke to the earth. He said, let the earth bring forth all the living creatures of, and then when he created the, the, the beast of the sea, he spoke to the waters. He said, let the sea bring forth all the living creatures that shall be there. But when God created you and I, he didn't speak to the earth. He didn't speak to the sea. He spoke to himself and he said, let us make man in our own image and in our own likeness. And so what we can see is that whatever you come out of is the environment where you thrive and where you succeed. The reason God spoke to the earth to bring forth the creatures of the earth is because that's where they succeed. A lion succeeds in the jungle on the earth, right? The reason he spoke to the sea to bring forth those creatures of the sea is because a great white shark succeeds in the ocean. Now you cannot take a lion from the jungle and put him in the ocean. He's going to drown. And you cannot take a, a great white shark and put him in the jungle because he's going to die. And so they, the, the environment they came from is the environment where they succeed. And so it's the same with you and I. We come from God. Let us make man in our own image, in our own likeness. And then God brought forth man. He's breathed Adam out of himself and put Adam into that body. And so God is our, we are his offspring. We come from him. We derive our origin from God. And so it would be just as um, ridiculous or impossible for man to succeed outside of God than for a, a, a fish to succeed outside of water or for a lion to succeed outside of the land. It would be just as impossible. Mm -hmm. And so that means that God is the environment for mankind's success. When we are in him, we can live, move, have our being. We can succeed. We can thrive and we can have abundant life. Look at this in John chapter 15, verse 5. John chapter 15, verse 5 says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. Right? And so it's the same concept we get from, from in Genesis and in Acts 17, 3. That word abide means to be held. It means to remain as one, and it also means to continue to be present. So I like that word to be held. He who, he who allows me to hold them, right? God is not going to hold us down and force us, but he who allows, allows me to embrace them, he who allows me to hold them, you, you are abiding in me. God wants to embrace us. God wants to, um, to, to wrap his arms around us. He wants, phys he wants connection. He wants contact. He wants interaction, right? That's what it means to abide. He, it also means to remain as one. So he's saying that 
when we remain together with God as one, of one heart and of one mind and of one spirit, um, and when we continue to be present, meaning that I consciously make, take note that God is in my life, that he never leaves me or forsakes me, that I am, I am connected with him. When I remain conscious of that, there's a good book called Practicing the Presence of God. It just means that every day um, we take note that we are in God's presence, whether we feel him or not, whether things are spectacular in our life or not, whether we're doing mundane tasks or we're doing something that's exciting. We have to practice God's presence. We have to consciously remain present to him that thank you, Lord, for waking me up this morning or thank you, Lord, for giving me energy and breath. Thank you, Lord, for keeping me strong and healthy. Thank you, Lord, for starting my car this morning, right? Or whatever it might be, right? Thank you, Lord, for all the blessings and the things that you've done in my life. That's what it means to abide in God. It means to just constantly remain present. Keep yourself in a place where you are constantly acknowledging God's presence in your life. Um, and then that word in is very important, actually. Even though it's a small word, it's awesome. And it's a fixed position is what it means. A fixed position of rest. And so he says, who abides in, when we acknowledge that we are in a fixed position in terms of our relationship with God and that we can now rest and be confident of our position with God, that we are in Christ, we, have, we are fixed in Christ, and now we can have confidence and rest that that position is never going to change because it is fixed. We don't go in and out of Christ, right? Even if you stand up in this moment or you fall in the next moment, even when you fall, you're falling in Christ. And so it's not like you fell out of Christ. No, you fell in Christ. And, that's, and so you are in a fixed position where God is continuing to hold you as long as you allow him to. And so we can see that he says that when you are abiding in me, then you, I'm the vine, you're the branch, right? And so the life to the branch comes from the vine. And so as long as I'm connected to the vine, then I, I am connected to the life and that life will produ produce fruit in me. God's life produces God's kind of fruit. There can be all kinds of different fruit that come from different places, but if you want God's kind of fruit in your life, then you have to abide in him and be, stay connected to him. And as his life flows in you and through you, it will produce God kinds of results in your life. And so um, we need to abide, we need to remain present um, knowing that our position in Christ is fixed and we can rest confident that that position is not going to change and stay connected to the Lord because through that connection is where we get God's kind of results um, just popping up all over our lives. And so look at this in Acts chapter 3, verse 19, talking about times of refreshing. Verse 19 says, Repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. And I love that word refreshing. It means a cooling, it means a refreshing, and it means a recovery of breath. And finally, it means revival in the sense of personal revival, right? And so there's a cooling, there's a refreshing, there's a recovering of breath in terms of if you feel like you're living life at such a fast pace, or if you feel like um, you don't have time to breathe, if you feel like you're overwhelmed with the cares of this world or with things, um, you know, family issues and money issues and career issues, whatever it may be, it says that the, you can have recovery of breath, right? You can take a sigh of relief, right? And then personal revival. I know a lot of times we talk about revival in our communities, but I think that is an extension of personal revival of individuals in our communities. And so God says that he wants to give us personal revival if you've ever felt like, man, I'm so exhausted, I'm so depleted, I just feel empty, I just feel like I don't have anything to give. Like even mentally, I'm just tired, I'm just in this place where it's like, blah, like there's nothing there, I just feel so dry. It says that God, there are times where he can give us personal revival. He can bring, bring refreshing to our soul and to our minds refreshing to our bodies to give us vigor and health and strength, right? And so we can refresh ourselves in God's presence anytime we want. In fact, what he's saying here is that when you are born again, when you're converted, when your sins are forgiving, you enter into a time of refreshing, like the rest of your life should be a, a, a life, let's say, of refreshing because your sins are forgiven. You are now a branch put back into the vine. You are now reconnected back to the source 
the, of your success. God is your environment. And now as you abide in him, you abide in continual refreshing. You abide in continual personal revival. You, 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 don't, you, you're, you don't lose your breath because you're, you're in a place of rest, that fixed position of rest. And so this is something that I've noticed is that there are certain things that only the presence of God can heal. There are certain things that only the presence of God can cure. There are certain things that only the presence of God can fix in us. There are certain things that only the presence of God can remove from us. And so, yes, it's good to listen to other teachers. It's good to, to get in the word. It's good to, do, to go to um, different places of fellowship. But I, I highly encourage you to get along with God and to seek that presence and let the, let the presence of God just do in you what some other things cannot do for you. You know, there were times when David would go to King Saul and he would just worship the Lord and the presence of God would come into the place where Saul was tormented by that evil spirit. And the Bible says when, when David would worship and the presence of God would come, that Saul would actually find refreshing. He would find personal revival. He would, he would be able to take a breath, right? And he wasn't tormented anymore. So I encourage you, just acknowledge the presence of God. Continue to practice the presence of God and let the presence of God do things in you that um, other, may, uh, maybe other things may not be able to do. All right, so how do we actually walk in an intimate relationship with God? What does it actually look like? I just want to give you a few keys to walk in an intimacy with God, and then we will open up for questions. Number one is in Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13, and this is to recognize him as our source. Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13 says, For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the foundation of living waters, and hewn to themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. So, he says, they've done, they, we, he says, my people have hewn to themselves cis, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. The imagery is like if you've been doing physical exercise or you've been traveling in the heat of the day or you're just, you've been, you know, ex physically exhausted and you want some ice cold water to kind of quench your thirst, to kind of reset you and, and, and transition from, you know, that place of physical exertion to a place of rest. And then you come to that, you know, pitcher of water and you realize that there were holes in the bottom of it. And now at that moment when you're like, oh, man, I'm finally about to. And you realize that is, there's nothing in there. There's no water. There's no ice like and you cannot quench your thirst. That's what God is saying. He's saying that there are sometimes we kind of we kind of look to people or we may look to money. We may look to positions. We may look to different things in our lives. To, to take that cool drink from, to satisfy that thirst that we have deep down within us, to, to scratch that itch that we may have deep down within us, to satisfy us. And what God is saying is that there, all of those things are broken cisterns. You can fill them up with water, but five minutes later, all of that water is going to be gone. These, they are unreliable sources of refreshing. They are unreliable sources of restoration or of, of you, you just can't depend on them. And so sometimes we look to people to give us what only God can give us. Sometimes we look for, let's say, earthly success to give us what only God could give us. Sometimes we look, we think it's going to come from money or possessions or whatever it could be. But we have to, first of all, look at God as our source and that God is the only place where I can continually come. And he says, he who drinks of this water, Jesus told the woman at the well, he who drinks of this water that I'll give you, he shall never thirst again. And so I think sometimes we may even irritate or frustrate relationships because we're looking to extract from those relationships what they cannot give us. And so people cannot make us happy. People cannot give us worth. People cannot uh, give us identity. People cannot give us meaning, you know, and all, nothing in this world can, it's only God. Mm -hmm. And so we have to transition from the broken cisterns and we have to start looking to God to say, okay, Father, I come from you, I return to you, and now I look to you as the source of my life, right? Number two is staying connected. Matthew chapter four, verse four, staying connected. It says, but he answered and said, it is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So another way you could say this is that man lives by continual communication with God. 
That's how man lives. Now, man can survive with bread. Man can exist with bread. But if we want to live, if we want to have the abundant, I mean, animals can live just by bread alone, right? Animals can exist and survive by bread alone, but we don't have animal life. We have the God kind of life in us. And it's the God kind of life that God is calling to us. And it says that that is not a life of just mere existence, but this is a life of connection with God. It's the abundant life life at the highest level possible. And he says that this life comes from staying in continual communication with God. We live by maintaining that connection with the Lord. And so um, we can even see that with, uh, I think it's in Exodus um, 1 Kings 17, where it talks about the word of the Lord came to Elijah and it says, Elijah, go to the brook Cherith and there I've provided ravens to feed for you. Well, when the brook dried up, what happened? The word of the Lord came to Elijah and said, go to Zarephath for I've prepared a widow to take care of you, right? And, and, and when he got there, it's like, okay, the widow's dried up. She doesn't have any more substance in her house. She's about to cook some meal and that's it for her and her son and it's over. The word of the Lord came to Elijah and said, you know, you, uh, what was it, pour the oil in the thing or I forget, but he lived by every word that came from him. That's kind of my point is that Elijah wasn't just assuming what to do in his life. He wasn't just looking at his circumstances, trying to read what the will of God was. No, he was in continual communication with God. And so the word of the Lord came to him and helped him to navigate every situation in his life. And that's how we must live. We must live in a place of continual communication with God. All right. Number three is to be transparent with him, to be transparent with him. Hebrews chapter four, verses 12 to 13. It says, for the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two edged sword piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. All right. So being transparent with God, being vulnerable with God, being open and honest with God, because we understand that all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. In other words, God knows everything about us and he still loves us. God knows all of our secrets and he still loves us. Mm -hmm. He knows the things that you're going to go to your grave with. You won't even tell your spouse about. And God, he sees that it's open to his eyes and he still loves you. You know, a lot of times when we uh, like, you know, we come into the knowledge of something we've done wrong. And it's like, man, I, Lord, I didn't even know how long. And then you look back and you see like, man, this was a pattern or something that you struggle with. And then you start realizing that, you know what? God actually saw that before you saw it. And he never treated you any differently all of those times. Even though this is the moment in your life where you finally saw that thing, God saw it all that time. And it never uh, impacted the way he, he dealt with you or the way he interacted with you. In fact, there's a scripture, I don't remember exact verse, but in Psalms 103, the Bible says that God does not give us what we deserve. He does not treat us according to what we deserve. You know, God sees everything about us. He's aware of all of our weaknesses. He's aware of all of our flaws. He's, a, he's fully aware of our failures and he still chose you, right? He still picked you. He still wants to be with you. And so we have to understand that we should, we don't need to have fig leaves where we come to God with our fig leaf like Adam did, where it's like, God, you, you can't see my nakedness. You, I'm going to hide this from you. And God's like, I can see through a fig leaf, Adam. You know, like I saw you before you even had the fig leaf. I made your body. I know every detail of you. I'm intimately uh, aware of who you are. And I'm intimately aware of what just happened in your life, this major life transition where you've fallen and I still have come to you, even though you're hiding from me in the bushes and even though you're ashamed and you're condemned, I'm fully aware of everything that happened and I still want to help you. And so what did God do? He killed an animal, first time ever. God never created animals to be killed, but he's the first person to kill an animal so that he can cover the shame and the fear and the condemnation of Adam. Right. And so that just shows you that God sees everything about us and he still loves us. Mm. So the best thing to do is not to run away from God, but it's to run towards God. 
The Bible actually says in Hebrews 4, it says that we should come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and receive help in our time of need. So whenever you need help and you feel like, man, I'm ashamed of whatever, don't try to cover it up or run away from God. Be vulnerable, be open, run towards God, and he will help you in your time of need. He'll give you mercy and grace. And so um, the, the main thing I want to say is that don't have defense mechanisms for the Lord. You don't have to protect yourself from God. In fact, God's the one. He's your best friend. He's your ally. He's on your side. All right. I think we're on number four, right? Number four is give him your heart. Look at this in Proverbs chapter 23, verse 26. It says, my son, give me your heart and let your eyes observe my ways. Give me your heart. That kind of stands out to me. You know, God is speaking as a father and he's saying as a son, as my son, what I, re what I desire from you is that you just give me your heart. You know, I don't want your, you know, there's the heart and there's the hand. The hand is what we do from God, but the heart is who we are. And God isn't as much interested in our hand and what we do for him as much as he's interested in our heart and who we actually are. You know, a good picture of this is Martha and Mary, right? Mm -hmm. Martha was focused on the hand. I'm going to clean. I'm going to cook. I'm going to make sure that I'm going to do the work so that I'm, I'm work. She was literally working for God, working for Jesus. And she was frustrated. She said, you know, Lord, look at Mary. I'm doing all this work for you, right? I'm serving you, Lord. But look at my sister. She's not serving you. But Jesus said that actually she is. She's ministering unto me. We are ministering to one another. We're having a moment of connection. And he says that actually Mary has chosen the better part, right? Because remember, we abide in him as the branch. We get our life from the vine and we will bear fruit effortlessly. But Martha is just like, I don't want to abide. I don't want to uh, rest in you. I don't want to connect with you. I just want to work for you. And so we have to understand that working for God is not the same as relationship with God. Mm -hmm. And what God actually wants is not our work. He wants our heart. He who has the heart will have the hand automatically. But God is more focused on who um, he, he wants us more than what we can do for him. That's, that's the point that I really want to make. And so share your deepest desires, your deepest thoughts, your ambitions, your dreams with God, right? Share those things with God. God, here's my ambitions. Here's my dreams. Here's what I'm thinking. Here's what's important to me. Here's what goes on on the inside of me. Here's what what I think about every, give those things to the Lord, give the Lord your heart, and then the Lord will help you walk through all of those things. He'll help make sense of what happens on the inside of you. And I think that our heart is something that, uh, some, we desire for that heart to heart connection, but because of many times where we have been hurt or blindsided or di disappointed, it kind of keeps our heart close to us and we don't want to give anyone our heart. The, even the idea of actually opening up our heart to someone can seem terrifying because it's like, well, what happens if they hurt me? But here's the thing about God is that he is the one person in your life that is guaranteed to never hurt you. He's the one person in your life that's guaranteed to never disappoint you or let you down. And so you can give, if you won't give your heart to anybody else, you should most definitely give your heart to the Lord. And then whatever needs to take place in your heart, then God can do that because he has it, right? You've given him access to your heart. And I would just say that there's, you know, wherever we, in the places where we won't allow the Lord access is the places where the enemy lives, right? If I'm not allowing the Lord to shine light in those places, then that's where the enemy lives. But if I can let the Lord have my heart and shine light into every area of my heart, then there's no place for the enemy to hide in my heart. There's no pl place for lies to get embedded in my heart mm. because my heart is in the hands of my father and his light shines through everything and allows no room for deception or, you know, anything like that. And so let's see, I think we're on number five or six. Let's see number if I can. Five, I think. All right, we got one minute. Let's see if I can do this. <laughs> All right, number uh, five, I think, don't settle for past experiences. Matthew 17, verse 1 to 4. It says, now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, and led them up on a high mountain on, um, by themselves, and he was transfigured with them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him, 
Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make here three tabernacles, three houses, one for you, one for Moses and one for Elijah. Right. And so this is a very interesting thing is that six days after this is six days after Jesus rebuked Peter. Remember, he said, who do you say that I am? And Peter was like, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. He said, flesh and blood, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father in heaven. Very next breath, uh, Jesus says, I have to go and fulfill my purpose. And Peter says, we can't allow that to happen. You cannot go to the cross. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. Right. Because you mind the things of man and not the things of God. All right. So Jesus rebuked Peter. And six days later, Jesus took Peter on probably the most amazing experience he's ever had in his life. Even in second Peter, Peter refers to this experience when he went on the mount. And so I just want to show that to show that, like we're talking about being vulnerable and honest with like he sees everything about us just because we may say something wrong, do something wrong. God still wants to give us amazing experiences. God still wants to give us mind blowing experiences where we see things and we experience things with God that we may have never thought possible. So that, that just adds to my point. And then I just want to say that, you know, Peter wanted to take this one moment and this one experience and he wanted to make it the rest of his life. He's like, man, let's build an apartment complex and let's just live here with you and Moses and with uh, Elijah. We don't have to go anywhere. We don't have to, we, we can just live here for the rest of our lives. And so what Peter didn't understand is that experiences with God are not there for us to just stay there for the rest of our life. But we can move, you know, there's a lot of people that had experiences 30 years ago with God and they're still talking about it. They haven't had an experience yet. You know, there are times when uh, people have spoken in tongues and they had this incredible encounter with God and they spoke in other tongues, but they haven't spoken in tongues since then. And so it's like you can't settle for past experiences. You have to know, OK, I'm going to enjoy what God is doing in my life. This is incredible. This is a landmark. This is a monument that I'm going to put up and celebrate. I'm going to make sure that I remember this as a memorial to what God has done in my life. But I'm not going to stay here for the rest of my life. I'm going to move on to the next experience that God has for me. Right. And I'm going to move on from that to the next. So you can't settle for past experiences just because God done something incredible in your life doesn't mean that that's that's it. No, he's got lots more. He wants to do a new thing in your life and he wants to lead you into things that you may not even have thought possible. And so um, let's keep up with the, the changes that God is trying to make in our life. Let's keep up with the transitions that God wants us to go through in our lives. Let's keep up with the, the new thing that's in front of us that God says, yes, the, the, the glory of the, the latter shall be greater than the glory of the former, right? Mm. What I've done in your life in the past is nothing compared to what I'm going to do in your life now. And what I'm doing in your life now is nothing compared to what I want to do in your life in the future. That's how I want to live with the Lord. Uh, I got two more things and then I'm done. Matthew 14, verse 28 to 29. Uh, and Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me <clears throat> to come to you on the water. And so he said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Now, this one is trusting God, taking risk, being adventurous, you know, letting the Lord lead you like it takes faith for these experiences to happen. Jesus, I mean, Peter experienced Jesus in a way that all of those who stayed in the boat did not experience the Lord. Peter got to see that the same God who was in the boat is also the same God on the water, you know, but you never actually experience that until you take that leap of faith. You, you, you shift your weight from being in the boat to being on the water. And then you start to realize you start to experience God in a different way, a way you never experienced him before. And so like you to experience God in certain ways, you have to get out of your boat. Some of us, we came from our places and we came to Colorado and this was a, a way of getting out of our boat. Some of us, we, 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 we never had relationships and then we went into, and that was, a, but I don't know what your boat is, but you have to identify it for yourself and you have to get out of that boat. There's more to life than what's in your boat. The world is bigger than what is in your boat. There's experiences outside of your boat that God would have for you. And don't just take shelter in your comfort zone and live inside of that shell for the rest of your life. But just know that there are things outside of that shell, that comfort zone, and that boat 
that is actually waiting for you to experience it on the other side of that step of faith. Um, and so the last thing I'll say is just spend time with the Lord. Be still. Know that he is God. Jesus will take his disciples and he will say, come away, like spend time alone. Like you have to set, you have to put margins in your life. You have to put margins in your schedule. So you're not just running from one thing to another to another, but you have to have some margin in there so that you can actually take time and actually reflect and, and get refreshed, focus on the presence of God. And so that, um, that's, that's, that presence is the life giving, you know, place where we experience eternal life or relationship with God and so or intimacy with God. So that's what I had today. Amen. Uh, that was really good, Ricky. Thank you. And you've triggered a lot of questions. So Thanks. I don't know if we're going to get to them all today, but let's, let's start. Um, okay. Uh, Prince on chat is asking, is it possible for a Christian who abides in Christ to hear God wrongly, both through the still small voice in their heart and the written word? Um, I mean, I think it's, there's always a chance where we can miss God for sure. So um, that's, I mean, the, what does the Bible say? In 1 John chapter 5, it says that um, there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Spirit, the, the Father, the Spirit, and the Word, right? 1 John chapter 5. And so what we can say is that the Spirit of God and the Word of God, they both agree, right? The Spirit of God is never going to tell you something different than the Word of God and vice versa. And so if you want to check that, if you feel like, wow, man, I feel like the Lord is speaking something to my heart, that still small voice, but I feel like I may be missing it, or I feel like God is speaking something to me in the Word, but I feel like the Spirit's not bearing witness with that, then what I would do is I would take it to somebody that I trust, somebody that I walk life with, and I would submit it to them, and I would let them critique it for me and say, yeah, maybe some of this you heard from God, but the rest of that, that might have been something else, right? And so uh, I would submit that to counsel with somebody that you trust and let them kind of help you separate the meat from the bones of that word. Mm, that's awesome. Yeah. That's really good. Uh, Happiness on YouTube is asking, how do you deal with a family member or a spouse that disturbs my focus on God? Well, it depends. Oh, or a spouse, huh? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I don't know. <laughs> do you know, Claire? I mean... I mean, it's, it's difficult for us because my husband and I are equally yoked. So we, are, we respect each other right. in that, you yeah. know, um, I, I've never had an experience of being unequally yoked. So I don't know how to answer that. Um, yeah, you know. I think um, that's a <clears throat> tough one. But I mean, if, yeah, that's a tough one. I'm not really sure. I mean, if some, it, there's a lot of dynamics. I don't know if they respect your boundaries in your relationship with God. Like you say, hey, I would like to go and do this because this helps my relationship with God. And then they say, no, as your husband, I refuse to let you do that. Like, that's a tough one. I would say you, you might want to take that to your pastor and let your pastoral staff at church uh, walk you through that one. Mm. That's a tough one. Yeah. Um, if you need prayer, call our prayer line because we'll definitely pray with you. Yeah. Um, okay, Eugenia on YouTube is asking, uh, sometimes I feel restless in the waiting and it seems difficult to abide joyfully and be at peace. How do I die of that restlessness or die to that restlessness? Well, uh, is it uh, Hebrews chapter 6 says that imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. And so we see faith is the conviction. It's, it's, you can see something in your heart that you may not yet see in your life, but you have a conviction that is real. You know that it's real. You can see it in your heart. But what you do from the time that you see it in your heart to the time that you see it in your life is you have to exercise patience, right? From the time that God drops the promise, the reality of the promise in your heart, or he speaks it to you, and then you receive faith, right? And then to the time that you actually walk in that promise and you hold it in your hand, from that time is patience. And so same thing happened with Abraham. You know, Abraham was what, I believe 75 years old when God told him you're gonna have a son. And he was 100 years old when he actually received the son. So 25 years, he had to have faith and patience to inherit the promise. And so I would just say that, yes, God, I believe God's spoken to you and God's put something in your heart and you've got faith for that thing but you have to walk that out with patience. Mm. Um, and so that's, that's the best advice I could give you. Yeah. Faith and patience go together and that's how you in inherit the promises. And so you cannot put a time limit on the time from when God says, 
or how does Andrew say it, um, you know, from the time you say amen to here it is. Yeah. Right? From the time that God speaks to you and from the time that you see it, you know you may not be able to control that, but do whatever you can do to participate and to cooperate with what God's doing in your life. Um, but just know that it's going to take patience. Yeah. We've, we've always been blessed. Every time we've just waited, sometimes it's hard because yeah. you've got such a desire, you want to go, whatever, but every single time we've practiced patience, it's been a bigger blessing in the end, always. Yep. Yep. So, uh, Ricky, your teaching was so good today, um, and we're like seconds away from being out of time. Okay. So uh, I want to apologize to those of you whose questions we didn't get to. On Tuesdays at uh, 3 o'clock, um, one of our instructors are going to gather all the questions that we can't get to during the live Bible study and answer as many as we can then. So please tune back in. If we didn't get to your question today, please tune back in at Tuesday at 3 o'clock. If you need prayer, uh, 719-635-1111. If your question was urgent and you really need to speak to someone, um, call the prayer line and, yeah. and let them pray with you. But Ricky, thank you so much thank for today. You, I appreciate thank it. you guys for watching and spending your time with us this morning. And have a fantastic weekend. We'll see See you at Monday, uh, on Monday at 10 a.m. God bless you. Even in our darkest moments, a light imperishable still burns. A beacon of freedom and liberty and peace. What do we say, Williams? Join us every weekday for our daily live stream on Gospel Truth TV. 